Hi everyone, uh, Tim Google here, William, Jago, and Mehdi. Hi gang. Uh, we'll just give everyone a few more minutes to arrive and get started. William, uh, would it be possible to update the invite with the agenda doc for future? Uh, I, okay, yeah, I can ask the Linux Foundation people to do that. I, I don't think I have access. Actually, I was wondering if it's possible to just have one long running agenda doc, that way it doesn't have to change every week. Yeah, we could do that. Uh, we could do um, both. Yeah, both would be good too, yeah. <laughs> All right, let, let's, uh, let's use today's one then as the ongoing one. Um, I'll get it added in the agenda. All right, we may as well get started. Uh, Dan Cohn is just going to be a couple minutes late today, uh, but he has a very exciting update for us, um, which I won't spoil that surprise. Uh, so, in Jago, you had a couple of topics. Um, uh, yes. So, you linked the agenda into the chat. Is that right? I put it in, I can put it in the chat now. Yeah. So, uh, if you just open that up, the, yeah, the thing I want to make sure uh, that we over communicate in the first few releases where a conformance uh, program is getting off the ground and we're solidifying those communication channels uh, is that there have been uh, three conformance tests that I know of added to 110. Uh, and I just want to call that out here. So one uh, in the workloads API. Uh, there's a link to the daemon set test that was added. So these are E2E -E tests which existed before uh, and are now uh, exercised that process of going through adding uh, the conformance IT, making it a conformance test, getting it added to the gold list of conformance tests, uh, and uh, proposing that to SIG Architecture and getting uh, approvals from folks in SIG Architecture to include that in the conformance test suite. Uh, so in 1.8 and 1.9, there were no changes to that list of conformance tests. Uh, so this represents the first uh, set of new tests that are added to the conformance program. Uh, and so I just want to call out that we have exercised that process uh, and both in workloads API and in API machinery. Uh, there's one for garbage collection. Uh, there's another PR, which I will find by the time this call is over, uh, for watch. Uh, and my suggestion on this one is going to be that since it was not completed earlier and didn't get the milestone, my suggestion is that we have a convention that we don't add conformance tests during code freeze uh, leading up to 110, and that we instead include that in 111 
I'm open to other conversation on that, but that's my that's my current thinking. A couple of quick questions. Sure. Um, is there any reason? Like, I, I think I understand. We don't want to keep raising the bar for um, one nine customers that have already passed one nine conformance. But is there any reason why the demon set test wouldn't pass on a one nine cluster that we know of? Uh, there's no reason that I know of. Um, it's more about we we need a sane way uh, to track the list of tests against which a cluster is being uh, verified. And there may be some reason that a provider or a, a distribution or a platform just has a bug or it isn't uh, clear. Uh, and so we we can't be shifting the definition of conformance after that code freeze. Totally and so that, yeah. yeah, so that that's the philosophy behind uh, keeping the conformance tests that are associated with that version uh, as part of the cutting the release branch for that version. Right. Um, but if that's the only change, and maybe it's not, it sounds like a 1.9 cluster might actually pass 1.10 conformance. Uh, I would imagine that is true in these cases. Uh, I wouldn't expect over five or six versions that that would necessarily be true. So, uh, and, and, and it, I think in, so a one nine cluster would pass likely uh, because Damon set was in the V1 uh, API group, but a one eight cluster would not because that API group did not exist. It was in uh, extensions. So I, I think uh, as a prerequisite, as we're starting to review these changes going in, when we add new conformance tests there, if they're new for a specific version, there already exists inside the <laughs> test suite the ability to do version verification. So if only only run this this specific conformance test if greater than or equal to version. And I think we should definitely exercise that capability. But that's kind of where I was going with that. Well, I did the, so, so the EDE tests are part of the release branch that's cut. And so I would expect that by definition, the tests that are being run are being pulled from that repository in that release branch. Didn't we have a Sonoboy config for each version? We do have a Sonoboy config for each version, but the, the specific I've, I put a lot of effort in the last couple of releases to make sure that the latest version of whatever the conformance test suite is will be backwards compatible. And adding that capability for new feature additions to make sure that they disable for older versions is a very minimal change. Uh, and it also allows the latest version of the test suite, which may have fixes and other modifications to be able to run on older Kubernetes versions without you know, blowing it up. So I think that's super useful and important for uh, the sanity of the people who are maintaining these platforms and distributions. Uh, but for the, the purposes of the conformance, what would be the outcome if you ran the 1.9 conformance test against 1.7 and it just didn't run some of those tests because the version wasn't greater than once it would would you then essentially be you you would not have a mishmash of tests like so if you added new conformance tests and maybe something got promoted to v1 um then you you would fail those tests on a 17 cluster even though you could just add the version gate check as part of the test and skip if not version <coughs> So I, I think this okay. could just be part of a code review process for any new conformance tests. I'm just trying to call it out here. Right. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, I just the, the expectation would be that someone running a 1.9 cluster, even if that cluster would pass all of the 1.10 conformance tests, would not then be able to claim they are 1.10 compliant conformant. That's correct. Right. 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 Okay. So I mean, I mean, we we also have an additional check uh, when you submit the conformance conformance results. It has to actually be running that version of Kubernetes. So it, it would fail that separate check as well, if it's not anything else. Um, hey folks, Dan Khan joined late. I apologize for that. Hey, Dan. Yeah, uh, unbelievable um, 
a uh, one of the largest uh, consulting firms or um, uh, analyst firms just sent us a draft report saying, so you can um, just become a leader in Kubernetes by buying a platinum board seat at CNCF, right? And that's how you can take over the project. And so oh, I needed to do an urgent call with them and say, no, there's this thing called the Kubernetes <laughs> Steering Committee and the TUC and SIGs and yeah, it's amazing. I got here in eight minutes. Um, but e even though it's out of order, I, I was hoping to actually just give an update on this um, performance test process. Um, yeah, that'd be great. If, okay, so um, I, I just want to remind everybody for context that we started talking about this like right after we announced the program in September, and um, specifically, um, I think it's Anishi san from NEC pointed out that we're at a 14% um, acceptance rate on uh, <coughs> performance rate, test rate. And um, so I proposed to the governing board in December that we set aside money in 2018 to pay an external development company uh, to, to improve our tests. And the pushback that we got was, well, is the governing board signing up for an unlimited liability deal? We could pay someone to write tests, new APIs are going to go mature, and then there's going to be more tests to write. And so um, we then went to SIG Architecture um, in Austin and said, uh, hey, could we have a new rule that says that in order for uh, APIs to move from beta to stable, that they need to include conformance tests. And um, there was a discussion in the back and forth on that, and SIG Architecture promulgated a new rule, I mean, which is really like one bullet point, um, a couple weeks ago, and then I was able to bring that to the governing board uh, Monday and get sign-off um, that uh, uh, to essentially get approval for this budget. And so, in parallel, um, we've been negotiating with the firm Globin that um, Google has worked with in the past on external test development. And so, um, I just signed a contract, and they're starting. And just the, the ballpark number for this group is it's 25k per month for two developers plus a little bit of um, project management services. And so. Um, I'm, it's, I'm really eager now that we do whatever we can to support them on getting up to speed and, and begin to submit pull requests into SIG testing because all the work that they do is going to, needs to come through the regular process. And so, um, if uh, I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, help train them and, and shape that and, and make sure that the work's going well, and then hopefully after a couple months, uh, getting a lot of background noise, if maybe somebody could mute. But um, after a couple months, we'll begin to have some insight as to kind of what speed they can progress at and maybe begin to do some extrapolations as to um, how many months or years we're talking about here. But um, all that said, I, I do want to bring up the point that if this firm isn't the right one to do, it, it's you. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, um, if this isn't the right firm to use, we could cancel this contract with a 30-day termination. And so I, I, I don't want it to be seen as, oh, we're just you know locked into 300 k per year. The other side of it is, if it's going extremely well, um, we could potentially up the, um, up the spend rate and add in a third or a fourth person. So um, that's the overview. It, it's kind of starting now. Um, I I'm, would really encourage folks who care about this to to engage in SIG testing as um, these, these folks start producing some work and ensure that it's up to the, the quality standards and the pace and everything else that um, that is reasonable. Could I, I think, answer any questions about it? I think one of the agenda items from last meeting, if I don't recall, or even before that when we were in Austin was to get like a, a parent issue broken down in the main repo that identified the areas that needed uh, coverage so that way it wasn't just kind of ad hoc but we've up front listed down the key concerning areas that have the that require the most effort uh, I don't know if that's been done or not I think Yago mentioned wanting had it, having some type of uh, spreadsheet or other piece that he was going to write a new issue 
I vaguely recall this. Yeah, so this is Diego. Um, Mitra on the, the Google side has uh, volunteered to take that on, and part of that is to essentially shop around to the related SIGs as the domain experts on what should be in conformance for those uh, the components owned by those SIGs. She's in New York this week, so she's not on this call, I don't think. Uh, but she will be putting that together in the coming weeks, I think. Okay. Yeah, you might want to connect with uh, Srinivas. I believe he's been putting together a spreadsheet as well, and I think they might, you know, maybe be able to collaborate or something there, because I, I know he's already got Excellent. one. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah. Um, good. I have, uh, sorry, if, uh, I, I can talk about that once uh, at the end of the discussion or uh, oh, now, whichever the way. So. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Trini. Uh, Just yeah, essentially, I'm trying to build based off of you know uh, the APIs that we have, a uh, list of all the APIs in a spreadsheet form, and then uh, against that, say um, get put what is covered and what are the existing ETU tests in one column, and then what is currently uh, part of the conformance test suite, so that we can leverage and say this is the area like for example our back is not covered today and what all the apis there are four or five apis there and should uh, should be part of uh, the conformance then we we can we can use a spreadsheet to leverage and say this this is the work needs to be done right so that's that's what i'm heading for i do not have um access to other six at this point or i'm not and also, I'm not really contacting other six, but that would be great if I get information from them, then I will know exactly. It probably so, is much faster than reading through the code. So for traceability with upstream execution, the we might want to break down, like a, a logistical way that seems tenable would be to break down by API group and have a tracking issue for each API group. And then as people do PRs, the PRs can reference the issue and then we can close out the issue once it's completed. But I think the spreadsheet alone won't get you the logistical tracking you need for execution against upstream. You need to either reference the spreadsheet from a main set of tracking issues on upstream. So that way people who can do reviews can target the milestones that we wanna get stuff in by. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. The other thing I will point out is that I think we may have uh, focused on API surface area coverage because it is convenient and fairly easy to measure. Um, but there are other angles that we need to consider as well. Um, so there are certain APIs that have optional fields uh, that may be more important to test various uh, configurations given optional fields than it is to test certain APIs. Uh, likewise, there are many different patch operations that might be, and those combinations may be more important uh, in certain endpoints than to get to certain other endpoints, like the pod template API is one that is rarely used. So uh, I think it is that the number of endpoints that are hit during the conformance test is a meaningful metric, but it's not the only meaningful metric. And I think the prioritization should uh, include some of these other angles as well. Yeah, I, I'd agree. Can I ask a question yeah, on that line, particularly for Jago and, and Jim, which is that um, I believe in Austin, you guys or Brian mentioned some sort of rocket science work that was going on where there's an aspiration, I think, using um, some of the swagger definitions to try and be able to test a large swath of the APIs, at least at a surface level, um, uh, relatively quickly. And um, I just, could you remind, I, I, I might, I'm probably not summarizing that well, but could you just remind us what that thought is and if there's an issue associated with it? And then is it possible to get our test developers focused in an area that's far away from us, that, that is, um, won't be covered, assuming that that project goes forward. Uh, sure, I think that was me. Uh, there w was some work, uh, someone on my team was working on essentially a thought experiment about a data-driven test to explore the API and using that, uh, get a simplistic 
not flaky, but not entire, uh, not testing the behavior, but rather simply testing CRUD operations on specific resources. Uh, and it's based on some work that Eric Toon did previously for Auth that was seemed uh, valuable. Uh, I think that is still in the thought experiment phase and not in the uh, plan of record phase. One comment I think I saw recently from David Eads was, wow, this looks like a nightmare to maintain. Uh, anything that has a comment like that from someone thoughtful uh, is a concern. So, I just, uh, But the intention is, uh, just, is there a non-flaky, repeatable way to verify that endpoints are exposed? That may be necessary, but not sufficient to demonstrate that a cluster is uh, implementing the desired behavior of the end user. And I will drop the link to that uh, work in progress in the notes from today as well. That'd, that'd be, I appreciate that. And if, if just if Mitra in particular could just think about um, areas that, that uh, we could start on that even if that's thought experiment's totally successful, there's, a, I think, still a ton of other tests we want to be writing. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Completely agree with that. This would be a... Um, just a, maybe a first test to run before, you know, and if it fails, there's no reason to run the rest, for example. Okay, so just going back, uh, you had a proposal that we don't add a conformance test during the code freeze. Uh, is, that, is that something that, that people agree with? Or do we need to discuss that further? Uh, totally agree with that because it's too hard. There's too many other things that are happening during code freeze time to try to triage that in a meaningful way. I think it's it's almost like feature development and should be considered as such. Right. Yeah, and I think in five years we'll have no idea if some conformance test was added in 110 or 111, uh, but it will be very costly if it starts breaking just a couple of providers. Yeah. So. so basically, the, the set of conformance tests are kind of an artifact of the of the release in a way. Yeah, that's right, and that is intentional. Yeah. Actually, just right. jump in there for a sec. We we actually do have a version string. It's part of the conformance metadata, so we will know when it got added. That's right. Actually, the 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 documentation update I did for uh, for all the conformance tests from one nine. Uh, there is a release tag information in there which is like a string form. So we should be adding information about when the test is added or modified. So that kind of helps us track. But. All right, um, are there any other agenda topics for today? Uh, I added one more. And in fact, uh, Ben the Elder is here and can give this update. Uh, I just wanted to share uh, that there's a document process on, uh, published on contributing conformance tests back to test grid, which may be useful for other folks to be running their own CI, uh, running the conformance tests and posting those results back to test grid uh, to raise the visibility that there's some breaking change earlier in the process. Ben, do you want to? Um, well, I expect to have a PR out soon. It pretty much follows that doc. I have a small tool right now. It's a Python script, but I'm open to porting it to whatever works best for everyone. Um, pretty much just take the standard E2E log and JUnit output and prepares it for test grid. Test grid needs a little bit more metadata than when the job is run, something like that. And this specifically overlaps with the effort to extract the entry cloud providers and support new cloud providers and Kubernetes as well. Uh, one of the issues and challenges in having uh, more than just one set of binaries that's required to run Kubernetes in a meaningful way is that we uh, need to understand and visualize. Uh, and raise awareness when one contributor from one cloud provider inadvertently breaks another or all of the others. Uh, and so this was 
uh, an overlapping concern there, but the conformance tests are trending in the direction of being a really useful smoke test to run. Uh, and so that's where this effort originated. But I, I think it may be useful for this group also. So basically, if, if people had the test results to test grid, they'll get early warning. Uh, that's the for them. Uh, and it will give us the ability to have a single dashboard with multiple cloud providers. Uh, and so if we, for example, add a new conformance test or add a new feature and it breaks other cloud providers, uh, likely an engineer working in one group is not likely to be testing across every single cloud provider uh, or distribution. And so that's the intention. So Srini, I'm not sure of the status of your PR, whether it's been merged or not, but Srini has a PR out there to add some documentation to communities about how to add performance tests and what the expectations are in terms of documentation and stuff like that. I think it would be useful then to point to this document from that that's of the document, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. Basically, there is a location where um, you're talking about the conformance uh, guidelines to write the test and what about the metadata and all, all that. Would it make sense to pull this document into that other document or keep them separate? Um, I, I would keep them separate. From what, what yeah, is like a, a detail, the other is the process. <clears throat> okay, that's fine. But I do think having a link between them would be good or at least from the, from the Kubernetes documentation of how to do conformance testing and all the other stuff to this document would be useful. Agreed. So Srini, can you take care of that? Either add that to your existing PR or add another PR if the PR has already been merged? Sure. Thanks. All right, we, we should have I apologize, but uh, I had to drop off in two minutes. Uh, I'm at the uh, Open Source Leadership Summit. But is there anything else that I could do for you or answer? I mean, I'm very excited to start this work. But I'm really looking to this group and suggesting to make sure that it makes sense and is on the right track and if it's not to try and fix it. I had a quick question uh, while you're here, Dan, to inquire about whether or not we have meeting space or anything else set up for KubeCon EU. Uh, that's an excellent question and um, I don't know that we do, but I, I think it may not be too late to get it. Uh, William, you didn't reserve it, did you? Yeah, we, we have a the, Kubernetes conformance intro and, right, so um, and a deep dive. So we have two different ones set up. Yes, I think that the deep dive, we can just do like a regular meeting, uh, where, it's, where it's just like one of these. Um, and then the intro is kind of more aimed at people that have never heard of Kubernetes. Um, so actually, it's good that you raise this. Um, we should actually develop, I, I'd love to develop that program together. Like if, if, if we want to share the, um, share the talk. Uh, we can have a bunch of different people uh, maybe getting up and, and sharing their experiences. It's not a particularly long one, um, but, but yeah, that's kind of like high level topics just to like give people a, a rough intro and then the deep dive is more or less just a working session and people can just bring whatever questions they have. But uh, William, could you take the lead on drafting that and we could try and get it done in the next week or two so that um, people are thinking about it as they plan the schedules? The yeah, absolutely. absolutely. What about the un the, the unconference? I think um, Brad, you're setting that up, right? What's the relationship between that and the, these other two things? Or is that okay that they're all separate? <coughs> Seems like we can combine, right? Uh, I also uh, think that on um, on the day um, before the conference, um, we could run a conformance print that. Um, allow people to uh, write conformance tests. I, I'm not sure if that's uh... Yeah, we could do that if, if people are available. Um... Yeah, well, or like at the very least give an update of, uh, you know, what, what the state is and where people think we got to have more coverage um, or combine it with other topics that you know, folks have on this call. I think we've got a lot of flexibility there. Do you, do you think that could go in a deep dive that we have scheduled or, or should that be separate? My, my only concern is people is that people tend to be pretty busy that week. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. We might want to try to combine these events because I, I think I've heard yeah. three different events and I want to make sure we understand what the three are and whether we should start combining them because people aren't going to have time to go to all three. Yeah.
So I like in principle the idea of like a sprint or a hackathon on performance. It would be a good forcing function. Life seems to go on as soon as we break up from this meeting, so I am in favor. I just don't, yeah, I just don't know how, TV, how much availability people have that week. That's all. Uh, why don't we take that one offline? It sounds like there's an awkward silence that means no one's ready to really commit completely. So we'll take that well, offline it, and communicate it. It was going to be on day zero, right? On the unconference day. Isn't that like the, the, the uh, doc sprints? I mean, I mean, if you try and do it on the other days, I think you're going to have trouble. I, I'm happy to take a sprint on uh, day zero. But, um, okay. If everybody. Okay, if there's already time for it, um, sounds good, I guess. So that's Tuesday, is it? Or Wednesday? Mm. Or Monday, right? May 1st, right? <clears throat> May 1st. Okay. Yeah. yeah, May 1st. So that's Tuesday. That's Tuesday. So, so on a quick related topic, Shri, didn't you have a list of PRs that you needed folks to review and, and right. yeah. And that is true. Basically, for all the controls that I had, I did um, generate about seven PRs. Um, they are all consecutive numbers. I can um, I can show if uh, one of the PRs. Uh, thanks to Tim, he reviewed one of them. But uh, all these PRs are basically um, strengthening the documentation for the tests. Actually, what using the RFC 2119 format, basically, what should happen in Kubernetes when you run this test, um, and brief description of what test does. And also, we added release information of the, uh, into the test metadata. Um, so these PRs are basically documentation and cleanup. Uh, Sort of uh, uh, PRs. Um, I can go through. I, uh, it, it's in my backlog to go through it. The problem I've been having right now is we are, we are in lockdown for the end of the release. And so at the end of every release cycle is a exercise in firefighting. And I've been doing firefighting duty uh, for the last couple of days trying to track down a couple of test blockers that have occurred uh, for different areas. So it's on the backlog, but it's just not the highest priority right now. Absolutely, uh, I agree. Um, uh, that's uh, that's the the reason why I'm trying to um, um, emphasize on this is because once we want to generate the 110 conformance document um, uh, that I am putting out on CNCF yeah. right now, uh, the, the the documentation should use the new format. Of, um, for the test descriptions. Uh, that's pretty much it for me. Um, other than that, I will probably um, go through the spreadsheet uh, in the next meeting. So I'll have some content in there. Okay. Great. And so is the goal to publish the that doc uh, with the one point one release? The 1.10 release? Uh, for 110, yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay, I think that's every item I've seen so far um, on the agenda. Do people have any other topics they want to discuss? Okay, um, well, we'll set out a list of action items after this meeting. Uh, in particular, check out the, the doc from uh, Ben about uh, contributing to test grid. Looks like that's pretty valuable. Um, maybe we can send that out as an email so people don't miss it. And we'll get started on the two concessions. Um, for the unconference, do we need to actually do anything for that, or can we just do we just propose that on the day? No, no, I've, I've submitted something, so we'll see if it gets accepted. But what, what helped me uh, is 
you know, who are the list of folks who wanted to be involved and participate that? We can take that subgroup and all work together to put on something that, that, that will be you know, very productive. So I, I heard some names that I didn't recall besides myself and Jamie. Who else wanted to participate there? So if we can get those names, William, then we can have, you know, sort of a sub-meeting and figure that out. And, uh, Great, and Dan may have some influence in uh, helping get that accepted also. Just Excellent. <laughs> Dan, are you still there or did you drop I off? I think Dan might have worked. All right, fighting fires. <laughs> All right, well thanks everyone. Cool, and Srini, I added you as uh, one of the point people with Mitra to uh, to help come up with the prioritized list of EDU tests that should be in the conformance suite. Um, so you two awesome. can connect, that would be great. Awesome. Uh, and yeah, definitely. Thank, thanks. Super. Great. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, gang.